to learn about everything new and exciting or things you may already know, but uh, that are relevant to our upcoming 2022 municipal election. I am Catherine Moyle and I'm the Director of Corporate Services and the Township Clerk for the Township of King. I've had the privilege of uh, administering and managing uh, several elections in King over the many years that I have served King and uh, it's probably one of the most favorite things us clerky people like to do. Uh, the engagement with the community and the residents and gaining trust and, and confidence in how we manage impartially an election is, is uh, of utmost importance to our community and the right to democracy. So I welcome all of you here today that uh, are interested in gaining some additional information, uh, whether it's just to pique your interest or just to educate or to gain information for someone else as an agent or otherwise. Um, I uh, have with us, and the purpose of my intro is simply for the benefit of future candidates or anyone with any election questions, that here in King, there's both myself and then I have Denny Tim, who is the Deputy Clerk and Manager of Legislative Services. So he fills the boots of the clerk when the clerk is not able to. Um, myself as administering the election as the returning officer under the Elections Act. And then, uh, more important is to highlight and recognize and introduce Suzanne Kudnick. And Suzanne has been my sidekick for many, many elections now, and she is the election coordinator. And she will be dealing with most election related matters on a daily basis, as her focus and attention is given to ensuring that we all collectively manage and administer the elections at the uh, highest level possible and her customer service and her engagement with people throughout the term of the election campaign uh, nomination period and post-election and so on um, is, is just uh, incredible for the amount of work she does and the work that she may likely have with some of you that are participating today. So with that, I'm going to hand over the wheels to Suzanne to introduce uh, the optics of our meeting today as well as our speakers. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, on behalf of Catherine, Denny, and myself, I would like to welcome Verity Martin and Diane Ploss from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and all of our registrants attending this session today. I'm certain you will find this is quite informative and it's a great refresher for King's staff after a four-year break since our last municipal election. Please note that this session will be recorded and the recording will be uploaded to our website for future reference. There are other candidate sessions scheduled within York Region and the list of upcoming dates is available at king.ca slash elections. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature on the bottom right and select all panelists or email questions during the session to D T I M M at K I N G dot C A. All questions will be answered at the end of the session. During the session, we do ask that you mute your microphone and turn off your camera unless you are speaking. And my email is S C U D N I K at King dot C A if you have any future election related questions. I now turn it over to Verity Martin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Suzanne, for that welcome. I'd like to thank the Township of King for hosting today and also say thank you and congratulations to all of you for taking an interest in municipal governance. This presentation is intended to give you a high level overview of how municipal governments function, the roles and responsibilities of council, candidate eligibility requirements, and the rules you must follow as you conduct your campaign. Next slide, please. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I want to cover. Please note that these slides are intended to summarize some sections of the Municipal Elections Act and should not be relied upon for legal or official purposes. In that same vein, we are not lawyers and any legal matters should be referred to legal counsel. Next slide, please. Here is a brief outline of the topics that will be covered during the session. This deck will only cover issues covered in the Provincial Act, such as the Municipal Elections Act and the Municipal Act. The legislation does not address election signs rules, which are a municipal responsibility and information about local rules will be made available by your local municipal clerk who 
overseas municipal election. And with that, I will pass things over to Diane, who will be walking you through the first half of the presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. Running for municipal office. Local government is a level of government that is closest to the people and is the most accessible and responsive to the needs of the community. And it is a four year commitment if you are elected. Ontario municipal governments deliver local services while the province establishes the legislative framework for municipalities which seek to balance local autonomy, autonomy and flexibility with accountability and transparency of municipal operations. The Ontario government sets standards for most many local services such as land use planning, building regulation and social housing and the province provides it uh, provides funding to the municipalities to deliver some of these services. You should keep in mind government is not like business. You can't make everyone happy, so councils always have the difficult decisions of finding that balance. Before we get into the Municipal Elections Act, we want to provide a brief summary of municipal roles. Next slide, please. Let me start by saying that the Municipal Act stipulates that municipalities are created by the province to be responsible, accountable governments with respect to the matters within their jurisdiction. The Municipal Act, Planning Act, etc., sets out what is that municipal jurisdiction. To reinforce, to reinforce, each municipality is given powers and duties under the Municipal Act and other pieces of legislation for the purposes of providing good government. The next few slides will briefly illustrate the role of the mayor, the mayor's role as chief executive officer the role of council and the role of municipal staff. Next slide, please. Council has many roles, maintaining the financial integrity of the municipality, ensuring the accountability and transparency of the operations of the municipality, determining services the municipality provides. And there are a number of acts and pieces of legislation and regulations that impact your role. For example, the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, the Municipal Elections Act, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act, the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, and one that was very important during the pandemic was the um, Health Prote Protection and Promotion Act. Next slide, please. The role of council continued. It's important to remember that decisions of council are made as a collective group with all members of council, including mayors, deputy mayors, and councillors only having one vote. The affirmative outcome becomes the strategic direction for staff. Any refraining or abstention to a vote is a no vote. There is certainly some confusion on the point that the head of council can only vote in the case of a tied vote. The mayor should vote on every matter. The direction of the municipality is not decided by one person. All members of council have one vote and the affirmative outcome again becomes the strategic direction for staff. The Municipal Act sets out many responsibilities and limitations for the municipality and we'll talk about some of those on this slide, in these slides. Next slide, please. Just to emphasize again, all decisions must be made as a collective group. There are some differences in the role of mayor and councillors, but council as a whole must work together. The role of the head of, head of council is to act as a leader. He or she represents the municipality at official functions, presides over council meetings so that its business can be carried out efficiently and effectively, and provides leadership to council. Next slide, please. Role of council continued. Although the legislation refers to the head of council as the chief executive officer of the municipality, this may be confusing to people with a business background. It is a very different role. The head of council is actually, excuse me, the head of council 
actually has very few powers that can be exercised independently of the rest of council, except we're specifically dele delegated in cases of an emergency, um, procedure matters, and other pieces of legislation. Next slide, please. Staff role. A key feature of effective and efficient councils is a well-developed understanding of the council staff relation and each role each party has. Municipalities are required to have a policy on this. The role of this is a role of staff is set out in the Municipal Act. This would include implementing council's decisions and establishing administrative practices and procedures to carry out council decisions, to undertake research and provide advice to council on policies and programs of the municipality, carry out duties required by legislation or other duties assigned by the municipality. There are some municipal staff positions that are statutory, meaning they are set out in legislation the municipality does not really have a choice to have those positions. The clerk, the treasurer, the chief building official, and the fire chief. And it's important that council not interfere with the statutory or legislative obligations of those particular roles. Next slide, please. Role of the chief administrative officer. The function of the CAO is similar to the role of the chief executive officer in a business environment. The CAO is responsible for the general control and management of day-to-day -day operations of the municipality, which may include developing and implementing appropriate internal administrative practices and procedures in order to ensure efficient and accountable operations of the municipality. To help understand this role, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an illustration. Think about an hourglass. Council is at one end of that hourglass. Municipal staff are at the other end. And we all recognize, recognize that in the middle, the small part of that hourglass, it, there is a little bit of a narrowing that the sand has to flow through. That narrowing represents the CAO. If council wants to give specific direction, they flow through the CAO to staff, excuse me. And if staff want to provide information to council, that also flows through the CAO. Slide next slide, please. Council staff relations. At the bottom, at the bottom of this slide is it's one of my favorite um, slides that we have in this deck related to council staff relations. I think it it, it is very clear about what roles are. Council is the representative of the municipality. They provide direction and policy to staff. They make decisions, particularly at council meetings in the form of bylaws, and they provide political leadership. The CAO and staff, on the other hand, are meant to manage people and resources. Research, provide research and advice to colleagues and to council to implement the direction of council and to provide organizational leadership. Um, I'm gonna give you another analogy. You'll find that I, I like analogies, but this is my last one. The captain of a tall ship can represent council as a whole. And that captain is in charge of the boat and charts a course to a destination. And that's the strategic plan or direction to staff. Then the rest of the various staff in departments on board that tall ship have a specific responsibility and duties and duties in order to get that ship to the destination or to the goal. The staff reports into the captain or council let them know that the boat is on course or there may be a need for a temporary or a permanent shift in direction due to internal or external factors or pressures. This, al this report also um, will talk about the impact to the final destination or goal. 
Uh, these reports often include options that are intended to allow the captain or the council to make decisions about providing further direction or going in a different direction. Next slide, please. Representative role. The next few sides, slides will provide a bit more information on each of the roles of council as described in the counselor's guide. The representative role. I think, yeah. In the role as a representative, you were elected by your constituents to represent the views when dealing with issues that come before council. However, your constituents have many views, sometimes conflicting, and you can't keep them all happy. You need to look at the different views and consider what would be best for the municipality. For many issues, you will again have to consider opposing views and make decisions that are not popular. You should use your judgment and decide best based on the best interests of the municipality at whole. In practice, there's no single or correct approach to the representative role. And on many issues, you will find that you fall somewhere between the two opposing viewpoints. Next slide, policy making. This slide out, outlines the general process undertaken during the policy making role. Some council decisions are routine. Others establish general principles to help guide future actions. Those are often considered policy decisions. Some policies can be specific, such as a bylaw requiring a dog to be on a leash in a public area. Um, and policies require, required under the Municipal Act. Others can be broader and more general, such as an official plan. Next slide, please. Stewardship role. Another important role for Council is to ensure that the municipality's finance and administrative resources are being used as efficiently as possible. Next slide, please. Accountability and transparency. This slide outlines the policies that Council are required to adopt to support that framework. Ontario municipalities and members of Council operate under a legislative accountability and transparency framework that is not optional and includes rules for the municipality and rules for members of Council and some local boards. Accountability and transparency of elected officials is important to create and maintain public trust. Councils, of course, accountable to the public as elected officials. However, it's also important that policies and procedures are clearly set out and accessible um, so that they can guide the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality and be transparent. Next slide. Code of conduct, a code of codes of conduct are usually set out, set out expectations, standards for counselor conduct. Codes may help prevent ethical conflict and help serve the reference uh, as a reference throughout the operation of the term. Municipalities are required to establish codes of conduct for members and council and certain local boards that would include direction related to gifts benefits and hospitality, respectful conduct, include, including towards officers and employees of the municipality or local boards, the handling of confidential information, the, and the use of municipal or local board property and equipment. Accountability officers, next slide, please. Municipalities have a variety of accountability officers as part of their accountability and transparency framework. A closed meeting investigator and an integrity commissioner are mandatory under that framework. While an auditor general, a lobby registry, and the municipal ombudsman are available for the municipal to appoint optionally. An integrity commissioner operates independent of council and reports to the council with respect to the application of co the code of conduct of members and local boards, procedures, rules, and policies governing the ethical behavior of members of council and local boards. Next slide, please. 
The Ontario Ombudsman has a role with respect to municipalities. This role builds on the local accountability and transparency framework, and I would refer you to look through the slide for more information. Next slide. Privacy and confidentiality. Personal privacy and other confidentiality issues are an important practice and a legal consideration for municipal councillors and staff. If this is not handled properly, it could leave the municipality exposed to a legal action. The Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy is the primary statute for privacy and confidentiality. It sets out for collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. And just as a tip, there have been some interesting decisions around the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in the last few years related to council members. If elected, this will be very important for you to understand. Your municipal clerk will be a resource to help you with this. We are now going to move into election campaigning. Next slide, please. The role of the school board trustee. The Educa Education Act creates four different kinds of school boards. The English, English Language Public District School Board, the English Language Separate District School Board, the French Language Pub Public District School Board, and the French Language Separate District School Board. School trustees are a member of the school board. They are locally affected, represent, elected, excuse me, representatives of the public, and they are the community's advocate, advocate for education. Similar to municipal councils, only the board, not an individual trustee, has the authority to make decisions or create action. A trustee is often the first point of contact for parents and community members who have questions or concerns about their local school. Candidates should contact the applicable school board for further information about duties and commitments. Next slide, please. Role of the school trustee continued. The role of the school board trustee is to establish policy direction, participate in making decisions that benefit the entire school board while representing the interests of the constituents. It sounds very similar to a candidate's role. School board trustees are accountable to their constituents, the Ministry of Education, and families. Next slide, please. Municipal office eligibility and ineligibility. In order to run for office for a municipality, you must be an eligible elector, which means you must be able to vote. Um, so the list on this slide shows you both eligible, el sorry, next slide, please. Shows both eligible as well as ineligible um, uh, information related to running for office. You can only be nominated if, as of the day you are nominated, you are qualified to hold office under the Act and are not ineligible under the Municipal Elections Act or any other Act otherwise prohibited by law to be nominated or hold office. An important clarification is the Municipal Elections Act states that a person shall not be considered employee for uh, this section by reason only of being a volunteer firefighter. So in other words, you'll hear um, in my next um, bullet that many employees have to take um, a leave of absence. A volunteer firefighter is not considered employee and is not affected by these portions of the act. If a municipal, municipal employee wishes to run for office on that municipality's council, they must take a leave of absence before filing their nomination. If elected, he or she shall be deemed to have resigned from the employment immediately before making the declaration of office. If an employee of a municipality who wants to run for an office in a different municipality, they do not need to take a leave of absence or resign but they should check with their employer to see if there are any policies that could affect them. Uh, 
board, uh, school board trustee eligibility or ineligibility. Next, um, sorry, I may have messed up on my slides, Suzanne, I'm sorry. In order to run for office the municip for a municipality, you must be el an eligible elector. Um, this is for school board trustees, which means you must be able to vote so on the list showing on the slide shows you both eligibility and ineligibility to run for office as a school board trustee. Uh, again, I'm gonna reinforce, if you are an employee of any school board you and you wish to run for trustee, you must um, take an unpaid leave of absence um, before you uh, file your nomination forms. And this is very different from a municipal situation because um, the municipal situation is, situation is only if you are running in the municipality that you work. In a school board situation, it is if you work in any school board, you must take that leave of absence. If elected, you must resign your job. You cannot work for the school board and be a trustee in Ontario at the same time. Questions about school board eligibility should be directed to the secretary of the school board, who is usually the director of the school board. Third party advertising. Next slide. A third party advertiser is an individual, corporation or trade union that is registered in the municipality to promote, support, or oppose a candidate or a yes or no vote or um, answer to a question on the ballot. A third party advertisement means a third party advertisement means advertising in any broadcast, print, electronic, or other medium that has the purpose of promoting, supporting, or opposing a candidate or a yes no answer to the question on the ballot. The meaning of a third party in this context means that a person or entity who is not a candidate, but is still an entity advocating for issues related to the municipal election. Activities that do not involve spending money, such as discussions or expressions of opinion about a candidate are not considered third party advertising. So an example of that would be if you're just sitting around speaking to friends and neighbors about candidates or issues, uh, posting on social media that is in, in essence free, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or sending an email to a group or mailing list, advertising about an issue rather than a candidate or a yes, no answer to a question on the ballot is not considered third party advertising. For example, Signs saying support local business or keep the waterfront green would not be third party advertising, even if a candidate has made issues of part of made that issues part of their campaign. Next slide, please. Third party advertiser eligibility and ineligibility. Only the following persons on the slide and entities are eligible to file uh, a notice of registration. An individual who is normally residing in Ontario, a corporation that carries on business in Ontario, and a trade unit that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario. Ineligible to be a third party advertiser includes groups like associations or clubs that are not incorporated. Next slide, please. Nomination process. The first day for filing nominations is May 1st, 2022 for candidates and third party advertisers. Note that this is a Sunday. So most municipalities will be receiving nominations for the first time on the Monday, May 2nd. You may wish to check with your local municipality. The last day and time for filing nominations for the 2022 election is on Friday, August 19th, 2022 at 2 p.m., not the end of the day. Again, nomination day in 2022 is August 19th, 2022. Sorry, nomination day in um, it, August 20, 19th, 2022. This is the last day you can uh, file or withdraw. 
Withdraw of nomination. If a candidate withdraws a nomination, they are still required to file a campaign finance statement covering the financial transactions made in the campaign. If they've not spent any money or raised any funds, they can, there's a, a little box on the form that you can click um, and sign if the form and it's complete. It's not um, a very onerous process. If a nomination is withdrawn, the candidate is entitled to a refund of their nomination filing fee only after they file their financial statements and if they have to um, file auditor statements by the required deadline. The candidate guide has a number of examples um, that fit your situation related to withdrawal. There are actually some quite a few examples in that guide. And we'll talk about how you get your hands on those guides at the end. Next slide. Nomination process continued starting May 1st, 2 p.m. on August 19th, 2022. Nominations can be submitted to the clerk from anyone who meets the eligibility criteria to run. To file, candidates must complete a Form 1, the nomination paper, and submit it to the clerk along with the applicable nomination filing fee. The filing fee for anyone running for head of council is $200, and for other offices, it's $100. The clerk must be satisfied that you are eligible to run in order to certify your nomination. The clerk can ask you to show identification or fill out additional forms to prove that you are eligible to run for a particular office. The nomination form must have an original signature. If your nomination is not certified by the clerk, your name will not appear on the ballot. If there's a ward system, as long as you are eligible to vote in the municipality, you may run in any ward. If you do run in a ward where you do not live, you will not be able to vote for yourself as you must vote in the ward in which you reside. All campaign documents require original signatures, including um, signatures endorsing candidates' nominations where applicable. If electronic filing is permitted, it's, responsible, it's the responsibility of the candidate or third party advertiser to maintain these original records um, until after the next regular election. Um, in, in addition to the legislative requirements, each municipal clerk may establish their own local processes and procedures related to the submitting of a nomination. So it's important to contact your clerk or look on the, the uh, municipal website to understand your responsibilities. Nomination process, next slide please. Nominations process, 25 signature requirement. Municipal council candidates are required to obtain 25 nomination signatures on form two, unless the municipality has less than 4,000 electors. Nominators can nominate more than one candidate and are not required to vote for those candidates. Nominators must meet the eligibility requirements of a municipal elector at the time they sign the nomination form. In a ward system, the nominator can be anyone who is eligible to vote in the municipality, not just the ward. Both the clerk and the candidate are entitled to reply, uh, rely upon the information provided by the nominator. If the nominator did not meet the eligibility requirements when they signed the document, then they could be held accountable under penalty section of the Municipal Elections Act. Candidates should remember that even if electronic filing is permitted, they are required to obtain 25 original signatures endorsing their nomination where applicable um, and keep those records. Just a little tip, if a candidate wishes, to um, wishes, they can provide more than 25 signatures. And the reason this might be a good practice is we are hearing from a couple of municipalities um, since we've been out um, providing these, these uh, candidate sessions, um, some of the uh, um, candidates were unable to be certified because the nominators were not diligent in completing the information and the clerks 
were not satisfied that they could that those that they met the requirements. You should scrutinize each nominator, inform them to make sure um, any signatures or information they need to put on the form is complete. Um, but just in case, you may wish to take extra signatures just in case some are disqualified. The requirement for nominators um, to sign nomination forms does not apply to the school board. Next slide, please. Running for a different office. Occasionally, a candidate changes their mind and decides to run for a different office. You can run for only one office at a time. If a candidate files a second nomination, the first nomination is deemed withdrawn. If a candidate decides to run for another office and they've already collected 25 endorsement signatures, they can use those endorsements for the next office. It seems a little bit complicated, but there are there is a lot of information in the candidates guides and examples that will help you with um, the sections we've been talking about. If a candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board, and both positions are elected at large, everything from the municipal campaign is transferred to the second campaign and only one financial statement is required. If the candidate it runs for a different office on the same council or school board, and one or both offices are elected by ward, the two campaigns must be kept separate and you must file two financial statements when, uh, by the deadline. Next slide. Registration of third party advertisers. Individuals, corporations, and trade unions may register to be third party advertisers. There is no registration fee for third party advertisers. A third party advertiser would register with the clerk at a local municipality using the prescribed form and must include a declaration of qualifications signed by the individual or by a representative of the corporation or the trade union, as it may be. Once registered, they may advertise in support or in opposition to a candidate being elected um, in that municipality or um, a yes, no uh, associated with a uh, question on the ballot. This would include council, trustee, and directly elected um, candidates to the upper tier. Any person or entity may advertise regarding any issue related to elections that the municipality without registering. We talked about that a little bit e earlier. For elections, the registrations cannot be, uh, excuse me, for a regular election, the registrations cannot be filed earlier than the first day of filing of filing for nominations and cannot be filed later than the Friday before voting day during the clerk's office hours. Once the clerk certifies the, no, um, the notice of registration, the individual corporation or trade un union is a registered third party advertiser for the election. Third party advertising is geographically based and is structured around the concept of influencing a specific set of voters in a specific location, for example, Mississauga or King. Registering in the, in the municipality where the third party advertiser hopes to influence votes allows flexibility to support or advocate, advocate against candidate, candidates in that very specific geography. If an individual wants to influence voters in more than one municipality, um, for example, over three municipalities covered in a specific school board trustee election, I'll give you an example, Durham Region, Whitby, Oshawa, Ajax, he, she would have to register in each of those three municipalities and conduct their activities in three separate campaigns. I think uh, Verity is going to speak a little bit more about this uh, later on or maybe I will. <laughs> Advertising about an issue rather than a candidate or a yes, no answer uh, to a question on the ballot is not considered third party advertising. Again, I'm just reminding you, um, for example, if it's, you know, says uh, support a local business or keep the waterfront green, green, those would not be third party advertising activities. Next slide, please. 
Registration of third-party advertisers. Third-party advertisers' registration is deemed to be withdrawn if they file a candidate nomination. This means that their advertising campaign would automatically end when they file their nomination. If a corporation or a trade union is registered as that third-party advertiser, it would not be affected by the person filing a candidate nomination, as the person would be this uh, would not be the same entity. But what you do have to understand is that um, the candidate, the person who became the candidate, needs to keep a, a healthy distance from the third party advertiser. Um, other otherwise, it would really create some optical optic issues. Third party advertisers and candidates would need to be careful to distance their activities um, and not commingle their finances. Existing campaign finance rules um, would not change. Finances, funds raised related to the third party advertising campaign cannot be transferred to a candidate's campaign. The existing campaign finance rules would not change. The third party advertiser who withdraws and closes their campaign cannot transfer that campaign to somebody else. So if I was the third party advertiser and I didn't want to do it anymore, but I was the one that registered myself on the paper, I can't give that uh, designation to anybody else. To maintain financial transparency around third party advertising campaigns, the financial statements of advertisers who end their campaign early should reflect the finances as of the day they ended. The registration period for third party advertisers runs um, until the Friday before voting day. Next slide. Contributions. Campaign accounts are only required if the candidate or third party advertiser raises or spends money. So for acclamations or campaigns where no funds are raised or spent, there is no need to open a campaign account. Trade unions and corporations are not eligible to contribute to candidates campaigns, although they can participate in the election as a third party advertiser or make contributions to a third party advertising campaign. Third party advertisers will generally need to follow the same rules for raising funds and financial reporting as candidates. Municipalities must establish rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal or local board resources during the campaign period. This must be passed by May 1st in the year of an election, and this further encourages accountability and transparency. The practice of municipalities providing the candidates information on their website is not a contribution and it's not prohibited. Generally, and, and I've mentioned this, generally the same contribution rules will apply for third party advertisers as they do for uh, candidates. If you are not going to run, uh, if sorry, let's try that again. If you are going to run, raise and spend money, the first thing you should do following your nomination is go to the bank and open a bank account exclusively for your campaign. Do not use a personal account. Next slide. Contributions continued. Candidates can accept contributions from individuals who normally reside in Ontario the candidate and their spouse. Contributions from the candidate and their spouse are considered to have come from the same person and do count against the self contribution limit. Third party advertisers may accept contributions from individuals normally resident in Ontario, trade unions that hold bargaining rights for employees in Ontario, and corporations that carry on business in Ontario. Corporations are deemed to be a single corporation if one of the corporations controls the others directly or indirectly, or if all of the corporations are owned or controlled by the same person or group of persons, either directly or indirectly. Next slide. Contributions continued. Um, 
Again, I would encourage you to review this slide. Um, this is a slide that shows you um, who can and cannot um, make contributions or can to a candidate or third party advertiser. Um, another area that gives um, candidates a little bit of a, a problem or a, a pause is, as mentioned above, only third party advertisers can accept contributions from corporations and, and unions. Uh, another tip, volunteers. The value of services provided by volunteers is generally not considered a contribution. And the volunteers I'm talking about here would be volunteers like your children, your wife, your neighbors, your friends who are going around and hammering in signs or handing out leaflets on your behalf. If a professional volunteer volunteers to provide services for which they are normally paid, the market value of the service must be recorded as a contribution by the volunteer, the professional, and is also a campaign expense. So some, so some examples of who might be considered a professional. Accountant, lawyer, professional photographer, um, those are sort of just some of them that you might consider. Another tip, you are obligated to inform contributors of their contribution limits. You may wish to create a, spe a spreadsheet or a chart to track those contributions to your campaign. And you can use your receipts to help you track that information. This may assist you in alerting contributors who are close to the limit. Unfortunately, you are only going to be able to track the contributions to your campaign. If somebody makes a contribution to somebody else's campaign, you uh, most likely will not know that. But what you are doing is you are taking care of what you are responsible for. Um, there is no rule that a candidate, family member, campaign staffer cannot contribute to third party advertising. But again, you want to be careful of those optics. Um, next slide, please. Contribution continued. Campaign contributions are monies, goods, or services given to a candidate for his or her election campaign. No anonymous contributions are permitted except in one situation, a pass the hat at a fundraising function, and that's limited to $25. So a fundraise, fundraising functions are events or activities held by or on behalf of a candidate for the primary purpose of raising money for the candidate's campaign. And that's a really important distinguisher. The primary purpose, um, there, we'll talk about some other examples. The price of admission for a fundraising function is a campaign contribution and a receipt must be issued for the full amount. Pass the hat donations that are under $25 may be given anonymously and you do not have to receipt these and the really important piece here is under 25. this is a this is campaign income and is not considered to be a contribution and the total amount received must be reported as such on the financial campaign financial statements and i will tell you in the campaign finance statements there is a designated section um, where you put details related to fundraisers. So I certainly recommend if you're planning on those bona fide fundraisers, having a look at that section to see what kind of information you have to keep. Um, outside of a fundraiser, cash contributions may be accepted up to $25, but you must issue a receipt and follow the receipt guidelines. Contributions more than $25 must be made by check, money, order, or a method that clearly shows where the funds came from. Contributions must be issued, excuse me, receipts must be issued for every contribution and should contain the name and address of the contributor and the amount and the date. These receipts cannot be used for provincial or federal income tax purposes. Next slide. Contribution limits. A limit on contributions to any one candidate or registered third party advertiser is $1,200. These, 
the individual contribution amount has increased from $750 to $1,200, but the aggregate amount of $5,000 stays the same. As a candidate, you're required to inform your contributors of these limits, um, you know, both the $1,200 and the $5,000 uh, limit. Um, and again, I would strongly recommend you find some way to track this information, at least for who is contributing to your campaign. Um, one of the suggestions that we do have is because you have to provide a receipt, we recommend that you um, integrate the information re um, with regard to the contribution limits right onto your receipt form. So when you hand that to the contributor, um, you can sort of say, you remind them about those contribution limits and they have it in writing. When you receive a contribution on a joint account check, you must determine which of the jointed parties made the contribution for receiving purposes. If more than one um, is contributing, it must be done on separate checks. Another tip, you were required to return any contribution that was made or accepted in contravi contravention of the Municipal Elections Act as soon as you learn it was an ineligible contribution. If you cannot return the contribution, you must turn it over to the municipal clerk. More information can be found in our candidates, voters, and third party advertising guides. So an example, I have um, Niagara as one of my territories and, um, you know, many of the municipalities have local American cottagers. So if you uh, live in a Canada US border town where there are a, a lot of American cottagers, for example, and you accidentally um, receive a contribution from a US citizen, you must return that as soon as you note the error. If you cannot return it, you must take that to the municipal clerk. And that's just one example of um, things that could happen. You need to understand who is ineligible as well as eligible. Next slide, please. Self-funding limits. Self-funding uh, self -funding limits for municipal council candidates is based on the number of electors voting for the office to a maximum of $25,000. This limit also applies to contributions made by the candidate's spouse. And so again, I spoke a little earlier about um, the spouse's contributions and the candidate's contributions are considered one. Um, it's not that the candidate and the spouse get two self-funding limits. It's only one, you have to remember that. Um, again, this formula sort of shows you how that is calculated. And there are no self-funding limits for school board candidates or third party advertisers. Um, next slide, please. Borrowing. Loans can only be borrowed from a bank or another recognized lending institution in Ontario and must be directed into the campaign account. Loans may only be guaranteed by the candidate or their spouse, while candidates can open a campaign account with their own funds, the, uh, the candidate cannot loan funds to his campaign to kickstart it with the intention of getting it back. There is only one way in which a candidate can reclaim um, a contribution or a start up amount. And that is if to, after you have filed your, uh, sorry, just before you file your financial statements, if you have a surplus, the candidate or his or her spouse may refund any contributions from the surplus. You cannot receive a loan from a family member or any corporate account that you may have access to. The loan is not considered to be campaign income and paying it back is not a campaign expense. But if you or your spouse guarantee the loan and the campaign does not repay all of it, the remaining balance is considered to be a contribution since the guarantor is basically providing the campaign the means to repay that loan. And you have to, again, if you're thinking back to self-funding limits, keep in mind the self-funding limit for the candidate and the spouse, um, apply against that self-funding limit, and um, you, if you have to pay back that loan, that will be a contribution that goes against that limit. Any interest on a campaign uh, on 
excuse me, any interest that the campaign pays on the loan is a campaign expense. Um, if you've taken a loan for your campaign, um, and again, I'm just repeating this and you don't repeat, repay all of it, the remaining is considered to be a, cont uh, a contribution by the spouse or the candidate. Um, and I know this sounds really silly that I have to say this, but I have received phone calls in other elections. Yes, you do have to pay back your campaign loans. At this point, I am going to um, hand the uh, session back over to Verity. All right, thank you so much, Diane. Now, before I jump in, I just want to note that there will be some repetition. I know this is a lot of information to throw at you today, and we just want to make sure that we've highlighted the most important sections. So if you could jump to the next slide, please. Candidates and third party advertisers should become familiar with campaign expense provisions. Campaign expenses are those costs incurred by the candidate or on the candidate's behalf during his or her campaign or by a third party advertiser during their campaign. The nomination filing fee is no longer an expense and is not included in the financial disclosure form. Goods and services donated to the campaign are also expenses and must be reported. A receipt must be provided for fair market value and only nominated persons or third party advertisers can incur expenses during their campaign period. Payment of any campaign expense must draw from the campaign account and a receipt providing the details and proof of payment must be obtained. All expenses must be reported in the relevant financial disclosure form to be filed with the clerk by the candidate or the third party advertiser. If you are paying with expenses with a credit card, make sure to keep notes and clear records as evidence that the expense was reimbursed from campaign funds in a, from a campaign account. Next slide, please. If you have run at a previous election and you want to use leftover goods, such as signs or office supplies, you must determine what the current market value for those goods would be and claim that amount as a campaign expense. So if you paid $500 for signs four years ago and now those same signs would cost $700, you have to claim $700 as an expense in order to use those signs. If you have leftover inventory at the end of this campaign, which you want to keep, it does become your personal property and storing it for future use would not be considered a campaign expense. Please remember that goods and services donated by a professional need to be reported first as a contribution with a receipt issued for the market value of the contribution and then must be recorded as a campaign expense at market value. Next slide, please. Now, I know Diane has already talked a bit about campaign spending limits, but I just want to review a couple of key points. The spending limit formula for candidates and the maximum amount for parties after voting day are set out in Ontario Regulation 101.97. The clerk will calculate your spending limit twice, once upon your, the candidate filing the nomination form, and then the second calculation will be based on the updated number of electors for the voters list that is released in September of 2022. Whichever, whichever of these numbers is higher will be your spending limit for this election. Next slide, please. The clerk will also provide two spending limits to third party advertisers. Once again, the higher of the two will be your final spending limit. If a TPA has registered in more than one municipality, each registration is a separate campaign with its own spending limit and therefore financial filing must be kept separate. Often TPAs that register in several municipalities will make joint purchases. This is fine, but make sure that the joint purchases are appropriately apportioned across the campaign. So make sure that every campaign marks their appropriate number. TPAs are also required to ensure contributions and expenses are tracked and accounted for. They must maintain proper records and provide proper direction to those incurring expenses or accepting contributions on their behalf and ensuring that spending limits are adhered to. Next slide, please. This slide outlines the only expenses which are not subject to the spending limit. Expenses related to fundraising functions are exempt from the spending limit, but in order to qualify as a fundraising function, an event must have the raising of money as its primary purpose. The financial disclosure form includes a section dedicated to fundraising functions. Campaign events at which incidental fundraising takes place do not qualify as fundraising functions. Similarly, a brochure promoting awareness of a candidate that contains contact information to make campaign contributions does not qualify as a fundraising function. Expenses that were subject to the spending limit if incurred before voting day are not subject to the spending limit if incurred after voting day. However, this doesn't give you an, 
method to play with your expenses. If you purchase something pre-election, but the invoice doesn't come in until after the election, you still have to expense it as a pre-election expense, and it has to go, it has to be within your spending limit. Next slide, please. TPA spending limits are similar to candidate spending limits. The general limit and the limit for expressions of appreciation in parties after voting day will be provided to them by the municipal clerk. Please ensure that you don't exceed any of your spending limits or use money dedicated for expressions of appreciation in parties to host, say, a birthday party for your spouse. If you use this money inappropriately, you may be subject to scrutiny and a compliance audit. Be reasonable. Don't try to get away with anything that isn't 100% above board. Next slide, please. It is important to ensure that you are fully aware of your responsibilities regarding election spending and fundraising. You as the candidate are your own chief financial officer and you are liable for any ineligible contributions, misuse of funds, or any other violation of campaign finance rules. I encourage you to familiarize yourself with the financial sections of the Municipal Elections Act, review the candidates and TPA guides in detail, and review the financial statements you will be required to file before you spend any money or accept any contributions. We have already mentioned this, but I just want to stress that if you intend to spend any money, even if you're just buying t-shirts for volunteers, you must open a campaign-specific bank account. Next slide, please. You must maintain complete and accurate records of every financial transaction during the course of your campaign. If anyone is helping you with your campaign finances, make, please make sure that they have read the guides and financial forms and understand the different ways in which contributions, campaign income, fundraising events, and spending limits are treated. You may wish to formalize records keeping policies and procedures for your campaign. This could include things like receipt templates and tracking documents, spreadsheets tracking contributions, expenses, and campaign income. I would be, really recommend that you put the legwork in now, get yourself organized, and make sure that you're, and that will allow your campaign to run very smoothly because you won't have to worry about what the rules are as you've already figured them out. All contributions and expenses are to be accounted for and disposed by the candidate on the relevant prescribed financial form. All candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep all financial records. This includes all of your receipts, everything absolutely everything until after November 15th, 2026, when a new council takes office. These rules apply regardless of whether or not you are elected. Next slide, please. This slide outlines some of the best practices for keeping your campaign finances organized. While I hope that none of you become subject to a compliance audit review, I encourage you to behave as though you will. Just assume that someone's going to go through everything with a fine tooth comb, keep that in your mind and make sure that you are prepared for that in case it does happen. And again, remember you have to maintain all of these records until the next council is in place in 2026. Next slide, please. We're now going to talk a bit about campaign advertising. So this slide covers all the information candidates are required to provide to publishers and broadcasters in writing before allowing campaign advertisements to appear. If you are advertising via signs, brochures, or any other format, candidates and TPAs are required to identify themselves. So I'm sure you've seen political messages before where the politician jumps in at the end and says, my name is this and I approve this message. This is why they're doing that. You have to take clear ownership of anything that is public facing. The period during which third party advertisements can appear is May 1st, 2022 until the closing of voting day on October 24th, 2022. Next slide, please. This slide it goes, looks at record retention for TPAs and broadcasters for advertising purchased. Remember advertising about an issue rather than a candidate or a yes, no answer on the, to a question on the ballot is not considered third party advertising. For example, signs saying support local business or keep the waterfront green would not be TPA, even if the candidate has made those issues part of their campaign. Next slide, please. All candidates are required to file form four with the clerk, regardless of how much or how little they spent or fundraise. So even if you spent nothing, you do have to you do have to submit this form. If you were nominated, even if you didn't run, even if you withdrew, even if you were acclaimed, any nomination you filed, you must also file a corresponding form four. If you registered as a third party advertiser, you must complete form eight. A candidate may submit resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline. If a candidate or third party advertiser feels that they will not meet the deadline, they may apply to the Superior Court of Justice for an extension prior to the March 31st, 2023 deadline. Next slide, please. 
If your campaign spending limit exceeds $10,000, even by a cent, you must appoint an auditor to complete an audit before the financial statement filing deadline, so make sure you book this auditor well in advance. The auditor must be licensed under the, the Public Accounting Act of 2004. Next slide, please. Candidates can file their financial documents at any time after voting day to January 3rd. Filing the financial statements ends the campaign period. This will make it easier for acclamations and campaigns where little or no expenses incurred. Clerks will be required to report whether candidates have met their financial filing obligations and publish that report on the municipal website or in another electronic form. This needs to be done by April 30th in the case of a regular election or within 90 days of a by-election. Next slide, please. The nomination fee is only refundable if the financial statement is filed on time. If a candidate or third party advertiser feels they will not meet the deadline, they may apply to the courts for an extension prior to the March 31st, 2023 deadline. A candidate or third party advertiser who misses the filing deadline may file within a 30 day grace period, providing a $500 late fee is paid to the municipality. If you require this extra 30 days, you will be subject to that $500 fee and your nomination fee will not be refunded. Next slide, please. When filing your financial statements, both candidates and TPAs with campaign surpluses must pay the entire amount to the clerk. The one exception is if you and your spouse made any contributions to your campaign, you are able to refund up to the amount of your contribution from the campaign surplus. For example, if you contributed $1,500 and you have a surplus of $2,000, you can refund yourself $1,500 and the remaining $500 must be turned over to the clerk. You cannot refund any other contributions. The clerk is required to place the surplus monies in trust for use by the candidate or the TPA if they are needed for a compliance audit. If neither of the candidates nor third party advertisers require the funds for these purposes, it becomes the property of the municipality or school board. Next slide, please. Every council and school board must establish a compliance audit committee. Members of a committee cannot be members of the council or school board, an employee or a candidate in the election, or a registered third party advertiser. The clerk will review contributions reported on a candidate's financial forms and prepare a report for consideration by the compliance audit committee if a con contributor appears to have exceeded any contribution limits. This process is not directly con connected to the compliance audit process. If it is apparent to the clerk that a contributor has exceeded one or more of the contribution limits, the clerk would report this to the committee, which would meet to determine whether or not to proceed with legal action. An elector is entitled to vote in an election may any electors entitled to vote in an election may apply for a compliance audit, even if the candidate has not filed a financial statement. The application must be in writing and set out the elector's reasons why they believe that the Municipal Elections Act has been contravened. It must be submitted to the municipal clerk or the secretary of the school board within 90 days of the filing deadline. The compliance audit committee will consider the application and decide whether or not to retain an auditor to undertake a compliance audit of the candidate's financial return. Next slide, please. Once a complaint has been filed, the compliance audit committee is required to review and provide brief written reasons for its decision. Compliance audit committee meetings are required to be open to the public and the committee may deliberate in private. The written reasons for the committee's decision shall be given to the candidate, the clerk with whom the candidate filed his or her nomination, the secretary of the local board, and the applicant. If an audit occurs, the report must be circulated to the same individuals. If the compliance audit determines that there has been an apparent contravention of the Municipal Elections Act, the committee will decide whether to proceed with legal action. Decisions of the committee may be appealed to the Superior Court of Justice. Any person who believes that a candidate has contravened the Municipal Elections Act may proceed with legal action without having first obtained a compliance audit. Next slide, please. The Municipal Elections Act sets out an offense constituting a corrupt practice. A corrupt practice is something very different from a complaint that goes to the Compliance Audit Committee. It is criminal and is handled by a special unit of the OPP. These are outlined on this slide. Next slide, please. This slide lists some of the penalties you could face as an individual candidate or as a third party advertiser if you contravene any of the rules of the Municipal Elections Act. Next slide, please. The preliminary list of electors as corrected by the clerk becomes the voters list on September 1st, 2022. 
the clerk determines how and when individuals apply to have their name and information corrected or added to or removed from the voters list. The clerk can also remove a name from the list if the clerk becomes aware that someone has passed away. Next slide, please. Candidates running an award are entitled only to that portion of the list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote for that office. The voters list shall not be posted in a public place and the voters list shall not be made available to the public by posting on an internet website or via any print or electronic medium of mass communication. Third party advertisers are not eligible to receive a copy of this list. Next slide, please. The clerk may require anyone who receives a copy of this list to sign a receipt acknowledging the list is only to be used for elections purposes and any other use would be in violation of the Municipal Elections Act. So keep in mind, there is a lot of really confidential personal information on these lists. They are being given to you to aid you with your campaign. Please do not distribute them to your real estate friends or to someone campaigning for something else. You have to specifically use this for your election only. Next slide, please. Eligible electors can appoint another person who is also an eligible elector to vote on their behalf. There are a number of reasons why someone would appoint someone else to vote on their behalf, including absence from the area, sudden illness, or so on. To appoint a proxy, you must submit a proxy form, which must be certified by the municipal clerk. No proxy appointments can be made until all nominations are closed. An eligible proxy voter can only exercise one proxy vote unless the proxy is acting on behalf of a spouse, sibling, parent, child, grandparent, or grandchild, in which case they can be a proxy for more than one person on that list. For example, their sibling and grandparent, or their parent and grandparent. Municipalities that use alternative voting systems, such as telephone or internet voting, may choose not to permit proxy voting. Next slide, please. Candidates and not third party advertisers may appoint scrutineers to represent them during the voting and the counting of votes, including during a recount. Scrutineers may observe, but they are not allowed to interfere with voters, attempt to influence how they vote, or ask a voter how they voted. If a scrutineer is not complying with the rules, they may be asked to leave. Scrutineers are a candidate's representative, so ensure that you choose someone who you feel represents you well. Please note, if the candidate wishes to enter a voting place and they have a scrutineer appointed, the scrutineer must leave. You can only have one representative of your campaign in a voting place at one time. Next slide, please. Okay, a recount is automatic if the vote is tied. Councils and school boards also have the option of establishing policies prior to this election that allow for an automatic recount. Council still retains the option to pass a resolution for a recount within 30 days after the clerk has declared the results of the election. An eligible elector can apply to the courts for a recount within 30 days of the clerk's declaration of the results. Next slide, please. So this slide just outlines some key dates that you will want to take note of. Please ensure that you double check check both the dates and the times. So don't assume that all deadlines are going to close at the end of the day. So for example, the last day to file a nomination, it ends at 2 p.m., not at 5. So make sure you double check. And next slide, please. So this slide just provides some links to some other resources that you may wish to look at. There's some legislation there that's relevant as well as the municipal elections guides. Uh, make sure that you make use of all of the information that's been provided and make sure that you feel very comfortable with all of this information before you dive into your campaign. Next slide, please. And that brings us to the end. Uh, happy to take any questions, but I'll also just note that my information is on the screen here. Um, I am your resource if you have any questions about campaigning. If you have questions more specifically about the, how the election is going to work, your clerk is the person to go to. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Verity. So at this point in time, I haven't received uh, any questions on the uh, chat, nor have I received any questions on uh, email separately. So uh, maybe we'll just give uh, another moment or so for folks uh, that uh, do have any questions. Uh, you can use the chat feature at the very uh, bottom of the uh, WebEx uh, platform. Uh, if you send it to the host, which is me, or to old panelists, uh, then um, all of us will uh, see the question that you are submitting. Uh, and if you're having issues connecting on the chat, you can also email me 
at d t i double m as in mary at king.ca um so why don't we just give a, a a minute just to see if there are any questions from any of our um registrants and then uh, we will pass it over to uh, suzanne to do some closing comments Nothing coming in, Danny? Okay, I just have uh, one question. Uh, big uh, thanks to our presenters. Uh, and just clarifying that uh, PowerPoint is part of one of the resources identified in the second last slide. So I don't think the PowerPoint is linked in that slide, but I believe, Suzanne, you said that it will be made available on your website. Absolutely. Perfect. And we are recording this session. So the session uh, will also be available for uh, those folks who are participating today to be able to go back to uh, review any of the material as well as to anyone uh, in the future who wants to uh, participate in, uh, and watch the, uh, the video. Okay. Um... Oh, I see there's another question come in, Danny. Yes. Uh, so the question is, when can we start putting up signs? So that is a question for our lovely municipal representatives. Um, it is, I believe, and I will verify and provide an answer to all attendees uh, uh, to, on this session today, but I believe it is 30 days prior to election day. But I will verify and provide a final answer. Anything else coming through, Denny? Nope, I'm not seeing anything else from anyone. So why don't we pass it over for some closing comments and then uh, we will end today's session. Okay, thank you, Denny. Um, I'd like to thank Diane and Verity for the, the very informative uh, session. Uh, we're coming away with lots of great information. Uh, it was a great session, so thank you very much. Um, appreciate that you're doing this for all the municipalities and towns. Uh, it, you know, in southern Ontario, at least. <laughs> um, if there's any other questions following the session, please send me an email. And if I can't answer it, I will reach out to Verity uh, or Diane. And uh, I'm again, I'm S C U D N I K at king.ca. So Suzanne, I just have uh, one question just uh, came through email. So we'll just uh, quickly uh, ask since we have Verity and uh, Diane here, uh, can a candidate act as a uh, scrutineer? You can, if you would like to be your own scrutineer. The idea is just there will be multiple polling places so you can have someone in everyone you would like, but yes, you can. Okay. And uh, that's a great question, and we are uh, compiling a, a frequently asked questions section for our election website. So uh, that I will add is one of the questions and answers on our website as well. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, I also uh, just got clarification from. Uh, our clerk uh, election signs uh, are permitted in the township commencing 28 days prior to election day for municipal elections and ending three days following the day of the election. So, uh, you know, with the um, uh, candidate uh, nomination uh, package that you'll receive, got, uh, Suzanne, all of those details, uh, some of those questions like that uh, will be part of that uh, candidate package, correct? Yes, we have quite a thorough um, candidate information package that we provide and we, we ask all candidates to uh, book an appointment with us when they're filing their nomination so that we can spend time with you to go through the package and explain all the information to you. 
because uh, there is quite a, a lot of information in our package. So um, um, feel free to uh, book appointments with us beginning uh, May 2nd. Perfect. I don't see anything else coming in. So uh, I'll just send uh, my thanks on behalf of uh, uh, all of our presenters today to all of our uh, individuals who have uh, registered today and participated in, uh, and have asked questions. So uh, thanks very much on behalf of uh, the clerk's division, on behalf of the elections team, uh, and on behalf of the Township of King. Yes, thank you everyone and happy Easter to everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.